This is Mommying While Muslim, recorded live and unedited. Watch as Zeba and Uzma record their podcast, see their reactions, and find out for yourself what all the buzz is about. This episode is sponsored by Guidance Residential. Guidance Residential has helped over 30,000 families achieve home ownership without compromising their faith. Will you be next? Let them help you. Find Guidance Residential both on Facebook and Instagram at Guidance Residential and get your questions answered. Don't let halal home ownership just be a dream to you. Assalamualaikum, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Mobbing While Muslim Podcast. This is Uzma Jaffrey. As you can see, Zeba Hassan is off today for fall break with her children. Um, and we are going to miss her, but we're so glad that she's getting her mommying time in because as of the publishing date of this recording, we will be entirely swept up in our retreat that she has been organizing tirelessly and she deserves a little pre-break. So uh, I hope she enjoys that. I wanted to talk about a very interesting situation because the roles were kind of reversed. I think we talked about um, people losing their temper and which parent does it more. And I admitted probably, I think it was last week or maybe the week before with our guest that it's usually me who's the belligerent parent and my husband is the calm one. Well, the table's turned. And uh, I'll give this as a teaching opportunity for how teenage brains work. So our new 13-year-old uh, wanted to make those microwave mac and cheese cups, right? And kids don't read directions these days. I remember I read directions all the time for everything on every box. and every, I was a label reader like my whole life. Even just eating cereal, I would be reading the label on the box because that was just me. But I have found that my children do not like to read directions. It's probably a personality thing and the way that they learn thing. So didn't read the directions and I'm studying downstairs uh, suddenly I hear there's a fire and there's smoke and I go up and yes, indeed, the microwave is smoking. And the first thing I did very calmly just looked at my 13 year old was like, did you put water in the mac and cheese cup? And he's like, oh crap. <laughs> so I explained to him like, this is why we read labels as I was cleaning up. But my husband comes in freaking out because of course the house reeks of nasty, disgusting smoke. And he's worried about, we've all inhaled a bunch of cancer from the carbon. And I'm like, dude, you you eat nacho cheese dip out of a, out of a can. Like I would worry about that more than I would worry about what happened in the microwave, but he was the one losing it, which is literally the fourth time in 16 and a half years that he has lost his, you know, cool. And I, I was just shocked. Like, wait, what's going on? You know, like the whole front frontal cortex, like a third of this kid's brain is not yet developed. Why are you freaking out about this of all things and not he forgot to load the dishwasher like I freak out. But, you know, it's just a matter of priorities and different things trigger different people. For him, it was how could you be so dumb? And I'm like, he's not being dumb. He actually didn't do this on purpose. He didn't realize that this is what could happen. But guess what? He's never going to forget. And harping on it isn't going to teach him any better. Just calm down. It's just mac and cheese. But um, that's not to say that it worked. It took several hours for my husband to de-escalate and the house still smells like smoke and it's been a week. But subhanAllah, everybody is safe. Everybody's awesome. And I, your girl, was able to keep her cool. So I just wanted everybody to know that and that to go down for the record that I was the cool parent for once. So that is my up to date for you guys. We are, in the meantime, continuing our series on Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So we want to talk about transitional homes. Uh, we used to call them shelters. I don't know if transitional homes is a newer term and more PC, but we're going to talk to our guests about that today and get educated. Uh, when people, specifically women, find themselves in unsafe domestic situations, they need spaces where they can have shelter and time to get their stuff in order and figure out what they're going to do, what their next steps will be to basically build a new life. So this is where transitional homes like Nissa Homes comes in. They have eight transitional homes across Canada. They provide security and hope for Muslim women who have suffered from domestic violence. And we can't be more honored to have the director, program director of Nissa Homes herself, Yasmin Yusuf, here to tell us about the services that they provide and why transitional homes are such a huge need, particularly in the Muslim community. So Jazakallah khair for coming and assalamu alaikum Yasmin. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you for having me. So we usually like to kick off the podcast by asking a little bit about your momming story, whatever you're comfortable sharing about your kids and your momming philosophy. 
Sure, yeah. So I have two uh, young boys. I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old. Um, and uh, they are um, quite a handful. Yes. <laughs> Just before. <laughs> I'm... So the two-year-old is taking a nap right now and, and uh, he's like right next to the room. So I'm really hoping he does not wake up uh, in case in you hear him crying throughout the, the podcast. Uh, right. <laughs> he's here. But yeah, I think, um, um, you know, you're talking about like who's the calm parent and who's the, I'm, I'm definitely the calm parent. I'm definitely the parent that's just, you know, um, I want to take it easy. I want my kids to have fun. I want them to, you know, learn. I'm not, I can't say I'm a gentle parenting. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know fully what that is, but I'm definitely the one that's just <laughs> easygoing. Like, okay, he made a mistake. You know, let's move on. My husband, um, who's a psychologist, is very much so into, you know, like, you know, he did this. We have these consequences. This is how we teach them this. And, you know, and, you know, you have to say no. You have to teach them. It's okay to, like, hear the word no. And, I'm just like, but if it doesn't harm, why not? <laughs> why not? Really it's just candy. <laughs> <laughs> if it's going to keep them happy, it's going to keep me happy and, and we're good. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but on a more serious note, um, I think raising boys is very, uh, it's, it's a, it's very scary. I, I've, you know, I, I, young when when I was younger I I did want to have boys it was like you know I just for some reason I was like I want to have boys when I grow up my kids I want to have boys um and now that I have boys I'm constantly thinking about like what is the world going to turn them into um and and what are they going to be influenced by and you know who who's going to be around them and how are they going to shape who they are and and just a lot of it has to do with social media, of course, and everything that it tells you in terms of, you know, if you do this, this is going to happen. If you do that and you have to respond this way and, and it's it's overwhelming. Um, but at the same time, you know, given the work that I do, I see the consequences of not raising boys well. And it's terrifying. Mm-hmm. And I think that's for me, like the biggest thing I want my boys to to grow up, to be respectful, to be good Muslims, to treat everyone around them with respect, whether they're man, women, you know, rich, poor, it does not matter. And I, I, I feel like that's the, the core, you know, growing up for us, it was really important to get good grades and, you know, to do well in school. And I made it really clear to my husband, I was like, you know what, I don't care what they do in school, as long as they're good people, that's all that matters. As long as they have good manners, as long as they're kind and good to the people around them, that's that's all that's needed because we have too many unfortunately people that are not um living with those standards unfortunately right absolutely that makes so much sense it speaks to my heart because i say the same thing since my kid was like you know around three they all want to be garbage men i was like i mean i want to be a garbage man when i grow up i want to be a ninja garbage man when i grow up and i was like dude be the best ninja garbage man you you can be like do that job like with pride and with excellence be happy but most importantly be kind so that's kind of when they went to school that was the last thing i would say to them is like be kind and they'd be like okay i roll but you know um i see it now that my oldest is started high school and he's like oh there's this person and they're kind of they sit alone at lunch so I, I try to make sure i go sit with them because none of the other people in the classes do and i'm like i'm so proud of you yeah. and he's like well sometimes it's me on me like i'm the guy <laughs> sitting by myself <laughs> and i'm like so you know it's good that you're doing it for somebody else and maybe mm-hmm. they'll see the example and come sit with you when you're alone okay. so i i'm it, it will pay off i promise you so you're making a very good investment um in their emotional intelligence right now so kudos to you for that So tell us a little bit about your family background and how that informed the work that you get in, you do now. Yeah. Um, You know, I can't really say I grew up wanting to do this kind of work. I, you know, I, I grew up, um, you know, the typical immigrant family, you know, just, you know, go into medicine or law or uh, business or, you know, when all else failed, they were just like, okay, just go into marketing. You know, at least that's got a bit of the creativity, but it's still got some of the business. And, when I couldn't do that either. <laughs> and I started at that point, I started looking into, uh, I said I was volunteering. This was in university, of course. Um, I started volunteering. I started getting into, you know, the student union at my university and getting into, you know, social justice and, and you know, that kind of stuff. And and a lot of it, obviously, as a visible Muslim woman, um, woman uh, it, you know, I it was a big part of my life, whether I liked it or not, you know, having to deal with um, discrimination, having to deal with, you know, systemic barriers and all that stuff. So, you know, it's, it's something you grow up with, you don't really think about too much, it just kind of becomes. 
our norm, unfortunately. Um, but when I started kind of looking into that when I was doing a lot more social justice work, and, and I come from a family that's very much into social justice, you know, we, we uh, um, were originally from Egypt, but very, you know, very active, there was a lot of activism growing up, I used to go to protests with my family, I used to, you know, mm -hmm. when things happened in Palestine, you know, we were always out there doing stuff, you know, my parents really pushed us to always volunteer and always, you know, wherever they would go, they would take us with them. And to the point where, yeah, like there were times where, um, you know, we'd have police ask us, why are you doing this? And, you know, question us. I remember the first time I got questioned by police in Egypt, I was, uh, I think it was like 10 years old, maybe or something. Um, so just very much so aware of like my social location and, and, and you know, just things that are going on. Um, so when I got involved with the social, with the student union, it really, it really spoke to that side of me. And I, I really felt like, I, I want to be doing things to help people. Um, marketing is not helping people. I don't want to help a corporation. I don't want to help, you know, someone get richer. I want to be helping people who are not, who don't have the opportunities, who don't have the resources. And of course, you know, as a Muslim woman, I mentioned, you know, it, it just clicked for me that I want to be helping those who've gone through experiences like mine or even more difficult. Like I am still privileged, alhamdulillah. You know, I, I, I you know, had an education. I, came, I come from a, um, you know, a, a good family and, and things were okay at home and all of that stuff. So I, I do have a lot of privilege and I wanted to be able to give that back because I also know what it feels like being, you know, marginalized when it, what it feels like being a Muslim woman. So I think that kind of started me down this path where I wanted to work with Muslim women I wanted to kind of give back um, and do things that would, you know, help others around me. Um, and then slowly things, subhanAllah, Allah's plan always works out better than, you know, our plan ever does. And things fell into place. I, I look back now, I'm like, I could not have planned this myself. SubhanAllah, there's no way I could have planned it to work out this way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses people to do certain things. And, and at the time I was... I was finishing university, I was getting married, my husband was involved with um, the organization that started Miss the Homes. And at that point, I was going, I was going back to school to study social work. And um, he was just like, you know what, if you're doing this, why don't you volunteer with this organization? And I was just like, oh, like, it's my husband's thing, like, I don't want to. One like, more thing to do. <laughs> I know, I'm like, I'm just going back to school, like, just give me a break, you know? And I, he kept, like, he kept, um, you know, telling me, just, just give it a shot, just, just call her, just, you know, here's her number, just whenever you can, they're doing such great work, you know, they really could get, you know, they could use your help. And I put it off for months, like months. And when I finally made that call, um, I was like, oh, you know, and, and at that point, they had just started talking about Nissa Homes because so the organization is called the National Zakat Foundation. And what they do is they collect Zakat locally and they give it, you know, they give it back locally. And what they were finding was they were getting a lot of single women, a lot of single moms applying over and over again. And their assistance mm -hmm. is short term. It's, you know, just a, like, a couple hundred dollars just to kind of get you out of a tight squeeze kind of thing. And that just was not meeting the needs of these women. Um, and, and, you know, seeing these women apply over and over again, they started to think, okay, well, what can we do to fix this problem in a more long term, sustainable way? Like, clearly giving them the money is not working. So what can we do to kind of help them, you know, give them money, but help them in a more su substantial way? And that's when the idea of Nissa Homes came about. And that's when, you know, we did research, you know, we we looked into what models exist, whether it's a shelter, a transitional home. And, you know, we can talk about the differences about uh, between the two. Um, and that's kind of that was like as they were doing the research, that's when I started getting involved. And I just, you know, I was volunteering at that time. I was just like, OK, you know, use me however you want. I want to, you know, I want to help out. Um, and slowly, you know, Nissa Homes started coming about and and. That's when I started, you know, I, I got a job with them and, and they're like, okay, well, if you're going to help out, you know, we want to hire you. And um, yeah, you're, this is where we are eight years, eight years later. <laughs> you know, the thing that sticks out to me there is that your husband pushed you to do this yeah. because um, one of our, uh, one of the reasons that this particular series uh, on domestic violence came to our podcast was because we're so disappointed in the Muslim men like literally heartbroken that they have so much power to change this globally to change this, but they don't do it. 
Um, and, you know, uh, Texas Women's uh, Foundation was on, they were our first guests on and they were like, no, no, we have really good male allies. There are good men out there. We have another gentleman coming um, from uh, Masjid Board as well to kind of defend men because we're like, dude, we're, we're, we're putting it on the table. Like we don't trust you anymore. Come on. Um, and I'm, I'm hearing, it, it's just really gratifying to hear that your husband pushed you to do this because that was not an environment that most of us grew up in. Uh, and we can talk about that later, but you did touch on something important. That is the difference between transitional homes and shelters. Can you explain to the audience what that is? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I also want to go back to say another point about this, but I, I'll come back to it. But the difference between a transitional home and a shelter is that Shelters are more for the emergency first response kind of thing. So someone is, is literally on the streets, getting them into place right then and there, whatever the time may be, 2 a.m., 10 p.m., it does not matter. That's what the shelter's for. It's very low barrier. You call, okay, you know, we have space. Okay, come right now. And, and this is the address. So that, that's what a shelter is, like that immediate quick response. Anytime, any, any situation, as long as there's a bed available, you can come. That's that's essentially what a shelter is, and the, and there are a few maybe a few different um, requirements. Let's say there's a women's shelter, obviously they won't accept men, you know that kind of thing. But for the most part, it's that okay if you meet the, this general criteria, you're homeless, you know we have a bed, and you're a, a female in in this like a VAW shelter, whatever it may be, then you can come in. Whereas with us, with a transitional home, you can come in directly, but a lot of our cases usually come from the shelter. So once things have like you know, calm down to some degree at a shelter, they would then come to us as they're starting to transition back into society. They're starting to transition back into independent living. That's what we're there for. That's where, you know, we come in to help them with that process because there's a couple of things to it. It takes a lot of time to find a place. You know, it's not, you know, a shelter, the stage is usually around two weeks. No one can find a job, find, you know, get income, find a place in two weeks. You're barely still figuring out, okay, I just left my home for you to start thinking about, okay, now I have to like, you know, figure everything out in my life. So it takes some time. It takes time and, and it takes time to heal also, to be ready to start doing these things. And so having that time in a transitional home where it's, you know, you know, a shelter's got a lot of high security and, and there's guards and there's all that stuff. Whereas with a transitional home, it's more independent style living. It's unfortunately, at the end of the day, the shelter system is very overwhelmed. Um, there's not enough beds, even the transitional home system. You know, we're seeing more transitional homes, uh, you know, pop up. But even then, we simply cannot keep up with the demand. So it's everyone's basically just doing what they can at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember being in college and saying, hey, I want to go volunteer at a shelter. And I wasn't even going to be like on site or anything. I was going to be on the call lines. Mm -hmm. And it was a fight in my house. Like, no, what will people say? Like, you're going to go and work in a shelter for women. Those people like break up families. Um, you know, there's still that stigma. I think that's one of the reasons mm -hmm. also why women don't go to domestic violence shelters is, you know, that stigma. Forget about the fact that they're so overworked and full. Um, it's what will people say if I go home wrecker? We've talked about it a lot, but you know, if somebody wants to volunteer now, I feel like things have changed 20 years later. Like you could go and not be called a home wrecker. I was a single woman at the time. And my parents were like, you'll never get married. If people find out that you're working in a domestic <laughs> violence shelter, like that kind of, yeah, it was, everything was going to prevent yeah. you from getting married. Like, don't just go that, you know? So <laughs> what would you say to volunteers now? Um, who want to come to Nissa Homes to volunteer? Like, what roles can they play? And, you know, what has been your experience in hearing about, you know, them from the community, if that makes sense? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I want to say we don't hear those things anymore, but we do. Unfortunately, awesome. we still do. Yeah, like, oh, you know, why are you breaking up families? Like, you know, you don't, we don't need to do this because, you know, we don't need to get divorced. Like, you know, it's it's not something that we need to worry about, even though like the woman will literally be on the street with bruises and they'll still say, no, you know, go back. Um, so we still hear that. We do get a lot of people that don't want to work with us because, yeah, you're breaking up families. And we're like, do you, do you understand that people that come to Nissa Homes, it is their last resort? You, you understand that they're on the street? I'm, and I'm not going and knocking on people's door and telling them, hey, come to Nissa right. Homes. They're right. coming <laughs> to us because they have it like they're not even coming to us when there's a problem. I wish they would because, you know, then we can prevent the issue from getting to that point. But they're coming to us when there's no other option. They're just, you know, things have gone to the point where 
it's not a mar- marriage anymore. It's not, there's, there's no safety. You mm-hmm. don't consider leaving your home unless it's that bad. Um, and I think a lot of people don't understand that, that it's not by choice that they're leaving. It's they have no other choice and that's why they're coming. Um, and so I do think that we still like, Alhamdulillah, you know, compared to when we started, so we started in 2015 and I compare how um, it was when I would try to work with the masajid or work with community members. And, and I would literally have people as I'm talking to them and explaining the project, just turn around and walk away. I've had literally that exact experience happen to me multiple times. And I would just, you know, I, I you know, I thought maybe it was me. And then, you know, I start slowly started to realize it's not me, it's the issue, right? It's, it's they don't want to deal with this concept. And, you, you know, the, the, the amazing thing though, is that Alhamdulillah, these same people that would turn around and walk away are now the ones calling us and telling us, hey, we want to work with you. Hey, here's some money so we can help you do better and do more. So things have changed a lot in the past, you know, I would say five, 10 years. I feel like we've gotten a lot more in terms of awareness, a lot more in terms of, you know, understanding what's going on and talking about the issue. Um, And I feel like that's also helped with volunteers. That's helped with us being able to get more people to support it. And the, the, you know, the saddest part, to be very honest with you, is that a lot of the volunteers that come to us have experienced it in some way, shape or form, not maybe not directly, but a family member, a friend, a cousin, a mom, um, you know, a daughter, anything like that. So many of them and, and some of them have experienced it themselves. But I would say pretty much everyone that volunteers with us volunteers because it's, it's something that's touched their lives. And they want to try and help others because maybe they couldn't help at that time or they tried to help. And Nissa Holmes was how they got that help, you know, different ways like that. And and I would say, alhamdulillah, we do have a lot of volunteers. Like, I mean, people are, are ready to help and they want to help and they want to do more. And, you know, I, I don't know what the conversations are at home, but I will also say, going back to your earlier point about, you know, men not doing enough, 100%, I, I you know, I think if if we did a better job in terms of talking about these issues and and have men, you know, they don't need to lead the conversation because at the end of the day, if we're talking about, you know, women's abuse and we're talking about women, it should be women at the forefront. But we need our men allies, right? And and I will also say, though, that a lot of the success of Nissa Homes is because of these male allies. Our biggest donors, our biggest supporters are all men. Um, and I always like to give this example, especially when I'm talking to non-Muslim media. I'm like, you know, a lot of times we we criticize the Muslim community. Oh, you know, um, men oppress women in Islam and all that stuff. But I'm like, I'll give you the best example. We have a shelter or a transitional shelter for Muslim women that is that was funded up until recently entirely by community donations, entirely 100% community donations, and a lot of it was coming from men. So. I understand that maybe they're not saying enough and they're not talking about it enough, but when it counts, the money, you know, they're literally putting their money where their mouth is. Um, and so I, I you know, I, I do obviously recognize that we need to do more, but I, I appreciate that so much because we would not, we would not be here. We would not be able to do what we're doing right now without those men and without their contributions, without their support, without, you know, there's so many male allies that are truly out there helping us and, and trying to spread the word and referring to us. And, and you know, they're, they're the ones that tell me, you know, just be careful with what you say, because, you know, that the reputation Nissa Holmes has is that it's breaking up families. I'll be like, okay, you know, I, you know, I, well, I'm not even saying anything. I'm not, <laughs> it's mm-hmm. the, the fact that we exist. Can we just all print flyers that say the women are not the ones that broke this home? You know, the person who threw the punch broke the home. Like, you know, can we just, can we plaster that all over the massage so that people can get in? (laughs) I don't know what else to do. Yeah, it's nuts. It's nuts. Victim blaming, like, like the perfect example of it, right? So you're talking about um, community funded transitional homes. Um, I think it's important for people who are listening to understand like the groundwork that it takes to establish a transitional home. So what kind of moves, if somebody in a community that doesn't have a transitional home, but realizes the need of it, like what are the first steps that they would have to take? What's been your experience uh, with Nissa Homes? It might be a little bit different because it's Canada versus the US, but I don't think it's that off. Yeah, no, I I don't think so. Especially, I mean, if I tell you kind of these points, you'll like, it it can apply anywhere, basically. Um, So Alhamdulillah, we are in the process of opening our ninth and 10th homes. Um, I would say mashallah, have, but I'm really sad that we need nine. I know it's bittersweet, right? right? Yeah. Exactly, yeah, bittersweet. exactly. It's unfortunate, mm-hmm. unfortunate parts, but um, here we are. 
Um, so, you know, uh, we've had a lot of experience with how to open, how to do the groundwork and how to like get started. And, and our 10 homes are across Canada. So we've literally had to go into places where we don't have any, you know, presence and, and start building a team and start, you know, um, figuring things out. And, you know, I would say the first, the first step is to do the research, research, right? You need to establish the need. You need to know why is this needed in this community? What is that need looking like too, right? Am I looking at, um, issues regarding just homelessness and poverty? Am I looking at issues regarding a lot of new immigrants? Am I looking at issues just, you know, with, uh, you know, a certain speaking, um, commu- you know, community, like a community that speaks a certain language. And obviously, you know, it goes without saying that, you know, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, it impacts every community, every religion. Um, there's no research to date that shows a certain community or certain religion or a certain culture that experiences more than the other. Um, even I think there's very, very little little research, unfortunately, done around um, the correlation between religion and, and intimate partner violence. But even the research that has been done has found that across every major religion, it's about 10 percent. Obviously, knowing that also most people do not report it. So the numbers are often higher than that, but at least the reported numbers around 10% across all major religions. Um, And I think the only very few um, factors that kind of correlate with intimate partner violence is socioeconomic status. Like we know the only thing that kind of is an in, can be an indicator. It's not, you know, if this is the sa- situation, then, you know, intimate partner violence will occur. But when families are going through difficult socioeconomic situations or, or challenges, there is more likely to be intimate partner violence. So that's the only time that, you know, you could say there's a bit of, but even then the, the research is so vague and so limited that it's, there's no, it's not, it's not if then, right? It's just, it could be one of the issues. Could be. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So you have to do the research, right? You have to understand what are the needs? What are the resources that exist? How many shelters are already there? What are the shelters experiencing? What are the shelters seeing that maybe they need help with, right? And, you know, when we started Nissa Homes, this was one, one of the big things that we found is that shelters were doing the necessary work, of course, but they were a one size fits all model. There, you know, you you know, this is the service we have. You, we don't care if you speak the same language. We don't care where you're coming from. We don't care, you know, what the situation is. This is our service. You take it or you leave it, right? Mm-hmm. And what we realized is that it's not working for our community, and and it's not working for a lot of communities. That's why, you know, here in Canada, we have a lot of indigenous shelters, shelters that cater specifically to indigenous indigenous women, understanding their culture, understanding the systemic oppression that exists, understanding the reason that they face barriers that are not the same as someone who is a white woman who has experienced intimate partner violence. Yes, it's challenging for her too, but it's 10 times more difficult for an indigenous woman. It's 10 times more difficult for a racialized woman or a woman with disabilities. All these are factors that make it harder and make it more dangerous and make it more difficult to leave. And so we need to understand the context of what's going on in our community, the context of what's going on in the shelter system. When we started Nissa Homes, as I was saying, we realized that a lot of the women that were coming to us were either refusing to go to a shelter. I I, I cannot go to a shelter, right? Like in, in their minds, they know the perception that we have of a shelter is that, you know, it's this big room where there's, you know, beds and everyone's sleeping together and there's drugs yeah. and alcohol and, you know, it's total chaos. That's not the case. Of course, we try to, you know, eliminate that, you know, that misconception. But at the same time, you know, I'm not going to sit here and try to convince her to go to to a shelter when she's in such a precarious situation. Right. I just want to help. So we understood that a lot of women are not going to the shelters. A lot of Muslim women, immigrant women, refugee women, um, non-status women were not going to shelters. Number one, because they didn't feel safe there. They didn't feel like they could. And then number two is because a lot of shelters have also, they won't help someone who doesn't have status, for example. So you have those that are even more, um, that, that are more in danger, not getting the help that they need. So we quickly recognize these things from doing our research, right? We recognize it from speaking to different places and understanding what's going on. We spoke to women that have been at shelters and, and the horrific experiences they had. Some had amazing experiences. This is not to say that shelters are horrible and and all of that, but also recognizing that they are underfunded, they are under-resourced, and so they they have to make cuts in in certain things, right? And and that includes, we had a woman that was staying at a shelter for, for weeks without a single person speaking her language. And she couldn't even work with the, she couldn't even work with the staff. No one spoke her language. They didn't have money to get interpreters. So she was not doing anything. For weeks, she was just sitting there. 
And then we've had other women that have had, you know, blatant Islamophobia in these shelters from the staff, but also from other clients. We've had women that have their hijabs pulled off. We've had women that weren't given food in Ramadan because it was after dinner time and the kitchen was closed. We've had women that, you know, they, they were made fun of for doing wudu in the in the washroom. Um, or women that, you know, we had a woman that had someone literally pee on her prayer mat. So very, very bad. We've had women that have garbage thrown at them. And, and these are all true stories that I've personally heard. Um, we've also had women that when they reach out for help, they're told like, you know, it's, it's because you're Muslim. Islam says you can, you know, the husband can treat the wife that way. So it, the solution is you have to leave Islam or why are you complaining? You're the one that chose to be Muslim. And so if you're experiencing, you're already experiencing the biggest problem you've ever experienced in your life. You're leaving your home. Exactly. You're leaving your home. You're leaving your family. You might even be leaving your kids behind everything you hold near and dear. Do you really think that this is the time for you to be telling me Islam is the problem too? The very probably the very few things that I have with me is my culture, my religion, my identity, and now I have to question that too. Like it's it's not reasonable, it's not right, it's it's re-traumatizing. Um, it just makes a difficult situation ten times worse. And what 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 do they end up doing? They end up going back. They end up going back to their abuser because at least you know that's a a, um, a difficult situation that I know versus a difficult situation I don't know. It's, you know, that fear of the unknown, right? And so these are things that, you know, you need to do the research to understand. You need to, you know, we, we actually got researchers that, um, and every time we, we launch a home, we, we have a survey that we do. We have, we collect all the resources in the city and we start going through them one by one and gathering as much data, as much information, as much anecdotal evidence even um, that can help us make the case for, okay, why is this needed? And what does the need look like? Are we talking about a 20 bed facility? Or are we talking about 10 beds? Are we talking about a shelter or a transitional home? All these things you, you can determine through the research. And as you can tell, I like the research. I've talked about it for a long time now. <laughs> I love it, I love um, it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's usually step one. Step two is building a team, right? You can't, you know, we, 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 we don't work on our own. We can't do this on our own. This work cannot be done, you know, individually. It's, it's a community issue. And, you know, I, I always like to say it's not a woman's issue. It's a community issue because this impacts the impact of intimate partner violence is not just on the woman. It is on the husband, um, it, the abuser. It is on the kids. It is on the family. It is on the, the neighborhood, the community. Everyone is impacted when something happens. Right. Um, so, I, I usually like to say that, yeah, you need to build a team. You need to have a team and you need to have supporters. You need to speak to the message, speak to the local organization, speak to who, whoever will support you in, in starting this up because you're going to need money. You're going to need to start, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we started with volunteers very, very early on. But the minute we started doing the work, we were employees. We were hired because you have to make sure that, you know, we're talking about people's lives. This is not something that you can do voluntarily. You need people that are committed and dedicated and getting paid. And, you know, there's timings, there's shifts that, you know, there's structure to it. It's not just, you know, let's help out when we can and when we feel like it. And right. oh, I got busy today, so I can't come in today. These are people's lives, like I said, right? You know, yeah. they are, they're putting their trust in you. You need to be able to meet, um, you're telling them that you can help. This is in a manner that you've given them. You have to help. So yeah. we, we have it's accountability and the staff. And I think a lot yeah. of communities don't realize you've got to pay, pay something to get something. To get the service. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I'm not exactly. a social worker. I don't know how to do any of this. Like I need to go find a social worker mm -hmm. and ask her not to do a second job after her first paying job, you know, to help our community members for free. It's not reasonable to do that. Exactly. And, and you know, she, that. she'll start off, she'll start off wanting to help. And we all do, right. We all do. How many all volunteering, how many times have you volunteered and got busy and stopped? right yeah it's the nature of volunteering you know when you can you do it when you can't you don't so right. it, it cannot be that way it has to be this is you know um it's not it's not a food bank or you know even a food bank I would I would say you still should have employees but <laughs> it's not it's not something where people are coming and going it's people are there all the time you cannot um slate out coordinate the safety and all this kind of stuff and mm -hmm. you know placement and housing employment exactly. whatever training whatever it is you're doing takes a lot counseling, of counseling exactly yeah. counseling um child care you know i'm not going to just trust anyone with these children right you know they they right. have to have qualifications i'm trusting them with vulnerable children 
So um, definitely there, you know, there has to be qualifications. They, you know, obviously, ideally, they're all social workers, but we don't have enough social workers in our community yet. Um, but, you know, there, there's different fields and there's different opportunities. So, yeah, so I started with the research, with, you know, getting a team, finding your supporters, your allies, your funders. Um, and that could also be government funding, right? That's where I guess the government piece comes in. In my experience, in our experience, unfortunately, that has been challenging. Um, and there's multiple reasons. Um, social services are generally underfunded. Shelters are generally underfunded. Um, it's it's just generally, whether it was a Muslim place or, or anything else, it's very hard to establish something new. Most of the organizations that we have here that have shelters have been around for from the 50s and 60s when shelters first started. And so they've had these funding contracts from day one. And so we're the new kids on the block that are just like, you know, starting it and doing things differently and all of that stuff. So there's a lot of like, uh, or, you know, we don't want to necessarily fund you yet. We don't know what you're going to do. So we started seeing the funding rolling in now. Alhamdulillah. I, I like to say one of the, the good things that came about with COVID is that we started getting government funding. Mm. Um, but uh, of course, it's not the it's not the same level. It's not to the same level as other uh, shelters that are around. So but the conversation needs to start. So if you're if someone is serious about doing this, they need to start those conversations with their local politicians, with their local members, you know, Canada's members of parliament. And I think in the U.S. it's members of the Senate or something. I don't know how it works in the U.S. too It's well. usually it's like so our much. local house and local Senate. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So then, you know, just start those conversations. Find your allies even there. Right. Find, you know, the Muslims, the women, the, you know, the ones that are speaking about these issues and, and start speaking to them and start, you know, Hey, we're working on this. Is there funding opportunities? And and I would even argue that for the funding, you need someone who's a professional grant writer, someone who knows how to write these grants, right? It's it's you're competing with people that have 50, 60 years, you know, over you. So you need to have good grant writing skills. Um, and so, you know, you start that way and, and grant writing is important. The connections are necessary too. You need and to it have costs those money to hire a professional grant writer. <laughs> and it's course, a lot of money. Of <laughs> a lot of money so th this whole like you know we we alhamdulillah i wouldn't say we um what, what we do obviously costs a lot of money um but it's not to the same level as like you know mainstream shelters or anything like that and you know as it is with many community-based organizations or grassroots organizations our dollar is stretched so far whereas you know with with other organizations it's you know that dollar and they're like no i can't do anything with it so <laughs> so we know like you know get a bit of money get a bit of that you know that initial donation and initial funding to get started maybe start a launch good maybe start something to get you you know a bit of money to start off and then build off of that i see okay yeah. so those are like the the two major things that you're saying or the three major things that you're saying is to do your research, build your team with plans to employ them, and then three, um, seek government allies um, to pursue government funding in particular for this. Yeah, yeah, and and I would say even you know seek allies in the community and in the government, uh, okay. because if you're if you're going to do something that's for the Muslim community, you want the Muslim you want you want your community locally to have that buy-in, right? You want if you can get you know if you can partner with your local masjid to do it, if you can partner with you know we know ultimately, and, and, you know, this is uh, unfortunately the fact is that in our community, the first place we go to when there's an issue is the masjid. The first mm -hmm. person we go to is the imam. So even if there are issues there, we want to partner with them so we can address those issues. And we want to be that, that, you know, okay, we're partnering with the masjid. So when an issue comes, they know to reach out to us. They know to speak to us and we'll deal with this issue. I see. And then while your government funding is pending, while you're trying to build up your reputation with local government to get funds, you need to rely on this community for private funding in the meantime. Exactly. And I, yeah. I take it that that's how your shelter was funded until it graduated to government funds yeah. now. Yeah. The one yeah. you were talking exactly. about. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah. And, awesome. and it's not easy. It's, it's not, you know, it takes time, but, you know, leveraging, leveraging the connections and leveraging, you know, whoever you can find that is willing to talk about it and to help you raise money and, and, you know, do that. And, and Hamdan, I think we're at a point where it's very different from when we started. And like I said, in 2015, I know it doesn't seem like it's that long ago, but you know, they didn't even have these like online platforms for like fundraising. Yeah, like, launch good. Yeah. no, no. So it was a very much like, literally I would call up people. I would, you know, speak to people, speak to family and speak to friends, I, you know, just one by one, but it is the most effective way to raise money. Just the personal connection. Oh, okay. 
That's good to yeah. know. Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what uh, part? Uh, what projects is Nissa Home currently working on, and um, what assistance do they need, or what potential helpers can step forward to um, see those projects to come to fruition? Yeah, yeah. So um, I talked earlier about how we have, you know, these two new homes in the works. Inshallah, our, our Halifax home is uh, is in the works. Inshallah, should be open within a week or so. So uh, literally right before this, uh, the podcast, I was, you know, texting um, my colleague just to kind of get things done. They're painting the home there right now and stuff. So we're working on that. And then we also have our Hamilton home, which is the 10th home opening up next month. Um, but the fact of the matter is, and I, I mentioned this earlier, we, we can't keep up with the demand, right? The, the bottom line is that um, I can build homes from now until next year. I can, I can have, you know, I can open a, ho a home every single day and I still will not meet the demand because the demand far outweighs the supply and the resources available. Um, and I'll give you some statistics to kind of, you know, put that in perspective. So for us at Nissa Homes only, we receive about around 50 to 70 calls every single day. Wow. every single day and those a majority of them obviously not all of them need a shelter but majority of them need help because of intimate partner violence in some way shape or form so that's 50 to 70 every single day there's no way if i build shelters from now until next year i, I can't i cannot keep up with that i cannot have a bed for every single person that calls um alhamdulillah today you know we've we've sheltered a hundred a thousand two hundred or so women and children uh, alhamdulillah, we've, we've assisted more than 6,000, more than 6,000 women and children um, who we could not shelter in our homes, but still needed help because, you know, our homes were full or they were in a different city or something like that. So the numbers are crazy. And I'll also give you another number. Um, so this is just in Canada. Um, in Canada, they found that around 600 women and children are turned away from shelters every single day because there's no space. Not for any other reason, because there's no space. And that every does not day. include every single day. And that does not include the thousands that are already in the shelters, right? So we're talking about, a, I think that the statistic was around 3,000 or something. I, I think it was more, to be honest with you. I think it was 3,000 women. And then it was another 2,000 something children. So about 5,000 that are already in shelters every single day. Um, so the numbers are horrific. Uh, the numbers are really bad. And when I say that, you know, no matter what I do, I cannot keep up with that demand. This is kind of, you know, you know, to answer your question, what we're trying to work on now is prevention. What we're trying to work on is the education, the awareness, the community prevention piece, because ultimately, like I said, I can't keep up with the demand. I have to lower the demand. <laughs> that is that is really what we want to try and focus on right now. We want to improve community awareness. We want to improve the education. We want to start, you know, start at a very young age, establishing what it means to be a boy, what it means to be a girl, what it means to be, um, you know, uh, what is manhood? What is what is um, what is toxic masculinity? What is the Prophet say? What was what was his example of being a husband, of being, a, a, you know, what was his example of, of his wives and how they were wives and all of that, using those as examples to start educating from a young age to combat the culture that we currently have which is very toxic when it comes to both men and when it comes to both boys and girls. We really need to re, you know, just to fight against the, the you know, popular culture. But even within our communities, there's a lot of toxic masculinity. There's a lot of, you know, you talked about earlier, anything you do goes back to marriage. That's a state, you know, that's how so many girls are, right? We're raised to like, don't talk too much because then you won't, you won't be able to get married. Don't be too educated. You won't be able to get don't married. Be don't do this. To, <laughs> don't be anything that was so problem. you can get married, right? And and yeah. so what does that do? It, you know, a, a lot of times the girls just end up, their whole life is around marriage. I need to get married. And when that marriage does not work out, their whole life is over. And yeah. they that's why they can't reach out for help because they feel like I, the only thing I was supposed to do was get married and I could even do that. And mm -hmm. so- we need to change that narrative. We need to change that understanding that, yes, of course, I'm not saying we don't get married or anything. I'm saying we need to have healthy understandings of what good relationships are, of what it means to be a husband, what it means to be a wife, and how to establish those healthy relationships with our families, with our friends, you know, and, and it starts at a young age. It starts, you know, the foundation of who we are now is built when we were younger. So we need to start it then, but we also need to start I can only talk to the kids so much. I have to talk to their parents, right? So right. we need education for the parents. We need education around, you know, a lot of times, unfortunately, the women that come to us are, you know, they're facing abuse from their 
from their parents too. They're not just facing abuse from their uh, their partners. A lot of times it could be from their parents. They're not even married yet. Um, or it could be from their in-laws. So we get that a lot, a lot, unfortunately, in our community. And so we need to educate the parents. We need to educate them what they can and can't do. What it, what it, You know, how I should be as a parent and how the prophet was as a parent. And let's use those examples. And I like to keep going back to the prophet Sassanam because that is the best example we have. And if we followed that example, if we followed the example of what he was like as a man, that is that we will have such a different community. Um, but unfortunately, so much of the abuse that happens is because we don't we misunderstand religion, we misunderstand the text, we misunderstand the, the verses and we misquote them and we use them as ways to um, to further oppress and harm others, unfortunately. So we need to we really need to kind of like explain things over again. Let's let's understand it. Let's, you know, look at it again and let's, you know, really understand what this means and let's clarify those misconceptions let's you know make sure that you know these men don't think that oh this verse is allowing you to do this or that or that you know islam says you can do this or that no this is what islam says this is what you need to be doing and we need to educate ourselves as a community also and that's you know all these are projects we're working on but one of the other things we need to educate ourselves as a community of what to do a lot of times you know you know we talked earlier about um, you know, the, the recent um, murder homicides that took place, a lot of times, you know, in many of these cases, you'll hear that they reached out for help and they were turned away. They reached out to their community, they reached out to friends, they reached out to family, they reached out to the masjid, and they were turned away. And that is the result at the end of the day, right? You're turned away, you're not going to be able to reach out for help again. We need to know how to respond when a friend, when a family member, when when anyone in the community, someone you literally see just at the masjid or someone you see at your kid's school, how do you how do you respond? What do you do to help? How, and and you know, I I all also kind of say that we have a lot of people that want to help, but they don't necessarily know how to help. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that can be very harmful um, because you know we get calls sometimes. They're like, I saw this lady and I brought her to my home and now I don't know what to do. Like, oh, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I appreciate you wanting to help, but you know that's yeah. what we're here for. Just call us. My family you used to do that. Your home. <laughs> My family was one of those families that did yeah. that, and you know it was crazy because one of the times somebody was parked outside of our house, and the homeowners association president noted it and was like, "Hey, this car is parked outside of your house. It's not your car. I know." Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he called the police one time, and the police like you know, it was like, what are you doing? And I think they were just, they were looking at our door because they knew that that woman and her child were with us. Mm -hmm. And, um, when the police popped the trunk, they found one of those things that with the suction that you put on a door to pull it off Mm -hmm. to get the like deadbolt off. Uh, and they couldn't arrest him because they didn't have any proof, but those guys didn't come after the police had shown up, but mm-hmm. you put yourself at significant risk and put your family exactly. at risk when you do yeah, that. And you put the woman at risk too. You know, it's great that you're trying to help, but you know, yeah. it doesn't always work that way. So a lot of education, a lot of awareness, a lot of, you know, even working with Masajid, our goal is to work with Masajid also to partner up with as many Masajid as possible so we can get that, you know, um, that message and that education out into the masjid where they, they have a community, right? You have the people that come to Jummah. Let's educate those people. Let's talk about it in, in, in whether we talk about it in the khutbah or we talk about after the khutbah or we have, you know, booths set up outside. Our or goal is ideally, to talk about it in the khutbah course, because then every single man has to listen. Yes. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, um, so, so we're trying to do a lot of that so that, you know, the education, the awareness is there and then, through that inshallah we can get more of that um more of the prevention so that the numbers can just get lower so it's educational programming that nissa homes is focusing on right now in addition to establishing these ninth and tenth homes and um for anybody who's interested in volunteering because we do have a significant population uh, or portion of our audience in canada so thank you canada for supporting us um Anytime. But we'll have your links <laughs> in our show notes so that they can reach out to you and see how they can help, whether it's with funding. Sometimes it's okay to be a check writer, but sometimes yeah. it's needed to be the mic holder. And I'm going to address that again to all of the men, like get on those mics, get in those members and start talking about what the work that needs to be done in order to re-educate our families or pre-educate our families, as you've been saying. Mm-hmm. So 
Um, this was all very important talk, but we want the audience to get to know you a little bit better personally, because like you said, this is very hard work. And had you volunteered, you probably would have um, burned out already, right? So yeah. we're glad oh, that you're still yeah. here in the space. So let's make it light, bright, and fun. We're going to put 90 seconds on the clock for our rapid fire section. And so the first thing on the top of your mind is always the correct answer. So don't think too hard about it. Okay. And it's okay to say you need more time. We'll skip it. We'll go to the next one. Okay. So I'm going to start. Bismillah. What book are you reading right now? I am reading Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. Oh, don't you just love her? Oh, hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. My alma mater. Yay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so, she's still uh, forever, so. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you love her. Um, so if there was any medal that you could win in an Olympic sport, real or fake, what would it be? running i used to do a lot of track and field yeah oh my god actually good at it <laughs> i respect you a lot because i don't run on purpose even if somebody is coming well at me i with stopped the now i completely stopped now so. <laughs> it was back in the day you're a busy then. lady i understand that um so if there was an uh, another career uh that you could choose besides social work what would it be mm, that's a good question I would, I think I would love to have like a coffee shop. I, would, I think I would love to like have a coffee shop and just run a coffee shop. <laughs> oh, that sounds so awesome. My <laughs> friends vibes. Um, let's, what is something that surprises people about you? Um, I moved to Canada when I was 18. A lot of people are always surprised. Oh, you were born and raised here. No. Wow. Yeah, yeah. no, I'm really surprised. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay. If there were, I like to ask this question. This is my favorite one to ask. If there's one dish that you could eat for the rest of your life three times a day, what would it be? It has to be a dish, right? It can't be chocolate. Yeah, it can Ice be a cream. food. It can be a food. Mm. So what is it one. for you? Oh, that's a hard one. Shop I, think probably, I know. <laughs> I, probably sandwiches. Like just any variation of sandwiches. Oh my like, god, you sandwiches. are friends. Remember Joey Triviani's <laughs> favorite yes, sandwiches? Me yes. too. <laughs> yeah, <same. laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on and educating us about uh, what transitional homes are and the work that they do. And may Allah bless you, reward you, and increase you, and Nissa Homes especially. But we're, we are going to pray that one day we don't need you and you all go 100%. Our that is my goal. That is my goal. Yeah. 100%. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on today, Yasmin. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. This episode is sponsored by Guidance Residential. Guidance Residential has helped over 30,000 families achieve home ownership without compromising their faith. Will you be next? Let them help you. Find Guidance Residential both on Facebook and Instagram at Guidance Residential and get your questions answered. Don't let halal home ownership just be a dream to you.